for watching our Zoom session today about contact tracing and why, along with testing, it's so important to stopping the spread of coronavirus. I'm Dr. Kara Odom-Walker, DHSS Secretary for the Delaware Department of Health and Social Services. To protect the people of Delaware, we must track the spread of this highly contagious disease, COVID-19. The average person infected with this virus can transmit it to two or three more people. We need to bring that reinfection rate down to about one in order to dramatically slow the transmission until we have a vaccine or cure. As a practicing family physician, it's important for me to talk to my patients about their risk for any disease and to use testing results as a way to inform next steps. With COVID-19, those testing results are absolutely critical because of the next step. We need people who are positive to isolate and for their close contacts to quarantine until we can learn if they are positive as well. Contact tracing is an important tool for public health that helps us connect test results to critical next steps. Today, to help further our understanding, I am joined by Tolbert Yemsla, Senior Research Associate at Johns Hopkins Bluebird School of Public Health. Tolbert has a tremendous set of experiences and we'll talk about the importance of nationwide contact tracing and what he learned from overseeing contact tracing during the Ebola outbreak in Liberia. David Cotton will also join us, Vice President of the Public Health Response and Evaluation in the Public Health Department at NORC at the University of Chicago. David will detail the plan for hiring in Delaware where they will serve and oversee it where it stands the type of people NORC is looking to hire and how our plan will be operationalized. I'm also joined by Edie morales yoke a licensed practical nurse at our Division of Public Health Clinic at the Adams State Service Center in Georgetown, who is doing contact tracing as we speak in case investigation. Edie will describe what's happening on the ground in Delaware and why it's so important for people to talk to contact tracers. I also want to acknowledge our ASL interpreter, Jamie, and for further inclusion and understanding, we will also have captions in Spanish. First, I want to explain Delaware's plan to expand our contact tracing program by sharing some slides. But before I do that, I want to thank Major General Michael Berry of the Delaware National Guard for allowing the men and women of the Guard to support our contact tracing efforts until we can hire and train our new workforce. So first, I'm going to pull up some slides. Uh, so first, I'm going to share a set of slides that give a brief overview of Delaware's plan for contact tracing. Uh, these slides are our current plan, and I will say that as we move forward, we will continue to learn and adjust as needed. Uh, so as of June 2nd, this is our approach. It starts with these standard principles where in orders to reopen America, Dr. Tom Frieden, former director of the Center for Disease Control, said we need to box in the virus, utilizing this four-cornered approach of testing, isolating, quarantining, and finding the virus. You create a closed loop so that at each wave of infection, there are fewer and fewer secondary infections in society so that more and more people can move about and proceed to beyond a new normal, but back uh, to normal. The goals of contact tracing fall into these four domains, where first we isolate and interview uh, those individuals who are COVID positive and probable positive cases to ensure that they isolate for at least 14 days based on symptoms to help prevent the spread of the virus. The second step is to quarantine, identify and interview contacts of COVID positive cases and ensure those individuals self-quarantine for at least 14 days to prevent the, the spread. The third principle is to monitor. We want to monitor both the index cases and contacts during their isolation and the self-quarantine and determine when they are cleared. And finally, we want to make sure that we provide additional resources to make sure that those who are in isolation and quarantine have the necessary resources to stay safe, to have, make sure they have food, safe housing, prescriptions, et cetera. So this is the challenge in front of us. We certainly started this pandemic and uh, have seen the spread of the virus outpace the current existing staff in our Division of Public Health. Additionally, if we look at models nationally and in our state, it indicates that the number of contacts that will need to be traced will continue to grow exponentially unless we don't uh, decrease the spread. So 
the essence of community tracing. It helps us connect contacts with the care and resources they need to prevent further transmission of the virus. Our interim and current plan has been to stand this up as quickly as possible between now and the end of June. It's staffed by 55 to 65 public health epidemiologists and case investigators, 105 national guardsmen, and they are responsible for doing telephonic contact tracing. They've been doing this work supporting us for about the last week. And then we also have 11 public health community health individuals who are doing field contact tracing to help make sure that we're connecting what's happening on the ground with the door-to-door -door at times interviews and resources. I'll describe briefly the roles so that you have a, a general um, concept of the different levels of work that's done by each of these team members. First, for the case investigators, they are those individuals who contact a newly diagnosed COVID-19 patient. They may explain the diagnosis and collect details on close contacts. They will enter those details into a database for the contact tracers. And they will, uh, of course, provide translation services for outreach for those contacts who may not be fluent in English. Additionally, the contact tracers will help reach out to those who may uh, have been exposed to someone who has tested positive. They will receive names and phone numbers of contacts. They will explain to the contact the procedure for testing and quarantine. They will provide resources and information on available testing locations. And additionally, we'll have language uh, resources available for those who are not fluent in English. We also have this third element around field case investigators. They will receive names and addresses of cases who we weren't able to reach by phone, may not be answering phone calls, but we may have other information from various sources around address or other locations. They'll help us also coordinate on the ground resources and outreach, help to find information to contact with them and coordinate testing uh, as needed, and coordinate with the Department of Health and Social Services, Division of Social Services, where they can help meet other basic needs around financial resources, food, housing, and other needs. Additionally, this workforce must, of course, have the ability to navigate in many different situations, including making sure that they're fluent in languages other than English. We also know that the field contact tracers um, that, um, are a, a part of our team that's growing very quickly. You can see we originally only had 11 individuals, and now we have uh, a plan in the robust contact tracing uh, layout to have 42 public health, community health workers, and field contact tracers. We will also be supporting uh, the telephonic contact tracing with 138 NRC staff out of the University of Chicago who are hiring individuals uh, from Delaware and from uh, their trained set of individuals who know how to contact individuals, ask questions, enter data into the database, and do some of the data analytics. Additionally, we will have 35 public health epidemiologists and case investigators, and this plan is to start by the end of this month. We will have a robust IT system that will fuel the engine to make sure that this information is tracked regularly using Salesforce. In the earlier slide, I named a database called REDCAP that was um, stood up in the early days, but definitely needs additional IT support and uh, technology in the long run. So our plan, as you can see here, is evolving, uh, but currently includes those 138 telephonic contact tracers and maybe more, depending on how many cases we see um, in the fall, but they will be recruited, hired, and trained and employed by NRC. Uh, there are job postings up on their website currently. And then they will have information that comes through the Salesforce platform that helps track key data created by Innovational, another support team that's in place uh, that has significant IT technology. Both of these teams at NRC and Innovational have been supporting work in Maryland, and we are learning uh, as they learn alongside them how to make sure that the data is connected and the people have the information necessary to be successful. We also know that there are often times where we aren't able to contact people by phone alone, and we need those field contact tracers, including three field directors, one per county, to help find and identify index and contact cases. 
monitor those who may be lost to follow up and coordinate resources for those who may have barriers in their ability to isolate and quarantine. And finally, the epidemiologist and data team at the Division of Public Health must ensure they can manage some of the most complicated cases, potential outbreaks, and direct the overall effort. So for us, success looks like these four boxes. Um, certainly, it means that we are operating in a new normal where uh, the community feels that they can go out and be much more safe and have a lower risk of exposure. But in order to do so, we have to make sure that these elements are in place, that contacts with COVID-19 positive patients are reached quickly with a positive result, a goal of 48 hours. Um, contacts who are socially vulnerable obviously will have the support that they need in order to do so. But we also want to make sure that contacts who are referred for testing within 40 hours, 48 hours and uh, will get recontacted if they don't get lab results within a time frame that's reasonable. Finally, the overall goal is beyond flattening the curve is to decrease transmission of infection. Efficient tracing and isolation of contacts will reduce the infection rate to less than one. So we have needed significant help to stand up this robust contact tracing program for the next 18 to 24 months that relies on subject matter experts who are guiding us uh, that are on the ground and also available for consultation with leaders and department staff at DHSF, already very extended health management associates has been assisting us provide additional capacity in addition to uh, guiding us on the startup support project management, uh, guiding IT support to the epidemiologists, training 100 uh, Delaware National Guard in contact tracing, training the interim field contact tracers, and serving as interim field directors. Uh, we have pulled in numerous subject matter experts locally and nationally to help guide this process. This uh, flow chart just shows a schematic of how each of these workflows are interconnected. I won't go into this in detail, but what you'll hear from my guests today is the idea that we need all of the elements to work together to exchange information and to make sure that we're connecting when we have risks identified uh, in order to have a robust long-term contact tracing plan. So thank you for that overview. I'm looking forward to our dialogue today. We've received significant numbers of questions. So, uh, so now to turn for a national perspective on contact tracing, I'd like to bring in our guests from Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, Albert Yinska. Thank you. Dr. Walcott, Secretary Kara, for the great presentation. The plan that you lay out is so comprehensive, very detailed. I am so impressed with the plan, the contact tracing plan for the state of Delaware. I think it's in the right direction to get up to zero. Uh, having done contact tracing in West Africa with Ebola. Uh, very detailed, granular contact tracing to find the cases, secondary cases and all of that. I see your plan has been so superb and great. Thanks to you and your team for doing that. So contact tracing for those of you who are here, first of all, she introduced me. I'm, I'm Torbert uh, Nyeswa, uh, senior research associate at the Department of International Health at the John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, and also an alumni of the school there, together with uh, Secretary. So uh, contact tracing is, an, it's a, it's a very, very important element of, of public health practice. And as an intervention that have been around for a couple of years as a major public health tool, we've used uh, contact tracing for diseases like smallpox. You know, we eradicated smallpox of a century ago. We dealt with uh, the H1N1 uh, avian Spanish flu. Contact tracing was used. Today, we still use contact tracing with dealing with tuberculosis. If someone gets tuberculosis and they have their medication and they cannot take their meds, the doctor we note that they are not taking their medication and we send people at their home or in your community 
to do community tracing so that people take their medication for TB, syphilis, and HIV, all of these vaccine preventable diseases like measles, we've used uh, contact tracing to do that. Just to lay out and let our audience and listeners know that contact tracing is not new. Quite recently, between 2014 and 2016, I was on the front line as the incident manager dealing with the incident management system with Ebola in West Africa that claimed the lives of 11,000 people in Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone, poor, resource poor setting countries in West Africa. And then that outbreak before WHO declared Ebola over in the human population, human to human transmission, we've had 28 thousand cases in about 24 million population that affected the capital cities of Monrovia, Freetown, and Conakry in, in Guinea. And for us to get to zero and for WHO, the World Health Organization, to declare that outbreak over in the human population in 2016, what we did was to find all of the contacts. Uh, Secretary lay it out what contact tracing is, and so I wouldn't buck down to that and go in detail to what that is. But it's simply finding who is confirmed, and I really love the fact that you want to do it within 24 to 48 hours. That's reasonable enough to make sure that if a confirmed case reaches the decks or the surveillance team, that a case is confirmed, you can reach out immediately to do some investigation where that confirmed case is coming from, and then line list their contacts and trace the contacts. During the West Africa Ebola outbreak, one of the major and important tools was used was contact tracing. As the, the, the United States talk about reopening the country, one of the interventions that I think that is very useful that we are promoting at John Hopkins is the issue of contact tracing. So I was a part of a team that developed the new course called the COVID-19 contact tracing that highlights how contact tracing is a key component of a public health strategy to slow the spread of COVID-19 without large scale shutdown and then the stay at home measures that can reopen this country. And contact tracing, as I said earlier, is a great public health practice that has been used successfully to break the chain of transmission. So what we did was by developing that course, New York State, the state of Maryland, the state of New Jersey, and other states are taking the lead right now that is reopening the country bit by bit because they are tracing all of their, their, all of their contacts. That course have had over 300,000 enrollment already and about 28 million people have, uh, mm -hmm. have uh, 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 watched or have watched the course and know a little bit about it, but over 300,000 people have taken the course. So my recommendation is if you want to know more about contact tracing, the basic information of the virus, you want to know the fundamentals of uh, contact tracing, the ethics mm -hmm. of contact tracing, some of the legal implications and how constitutional contact tracing is and some guidelines in our public health law of this country and the skills of effective communication, I will recommend mm -hmm. is on COSARA and you can use it. I will pause for now and take questions in the future. Thank you, Secretary, for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Tolbert, for that. And we really appreciate your perspective and the national landscape is critically important and the success you had with Ebola and your accomplishments and acknowledgements there are just truly impressive. Um, we wanna talk now about how we're implementing Delaware's contact tracing workforce plan. So for that, we'll turn to David Cotton, Vice President of the Public Health Response and Evaluation in the Public Health Department at NRC. Thank you for your comments and thanks for joining us, David. Thank you, Dr. Walker. Uh, we at NORC are very proud to be supporting you and the citizens of Delaware with this aspect of boxing in the epidemic as you demonstrated on your slide. Uh, Dr. Walker also noted that Delaware is putting in place a system 
that will allow rapid high volume calling to ensure that people get reached quickly. Under the guidance of DHSS, NORC is handling the recruitment and deployment of those phone-based contact tracers to complement the work of other DHSS staff, the field investigators, and other partner organizations. Um, you mentioned the other contractor, Innovational, who's working with the state to develop the case management system and the call center capabilities, which we and the state and other staff will use to manage all those data. So we are on target to hire 140 or 138 to be more specific uh, um, contact tracers who will be screened, hired, and trained before the launch date of June 24th. Um, applications were posted in multiple media outlets throughout Delaware uh, on May 22nd and the application process has been open since then, so for about 10, 10 days or so. Um, all new hiring that NORC will be doing for this uh, work in Delaware will be focused solely on Delaware residents. We are including a limited number of experienced NORC staff um, who can help with testing the system and providing insightful feedback uh, as it goes live to make sure that it's as efficient as possible and that the contact tracing process goes smoothly and more people get reached as quickly as possible. So thus far, we have had almost a thousand applications from Delaware residents. Um, the application process is open for another couple of days. So if there are folks who are still interested in applying, this is the time to submit an application. We were overwhelmed by the interest from people from across the state. Um, and so we will have more than enough uh, very strong applications to meet that um, 138 uh, positions. Um, we were, uh, we've already been able to hire people who are fluent in both Spanish and Haitian Creole, and we believe that we have more in the pool who have those language skills and others as well. And just to note, there will also be a language line available for people who do speak other languages and need uh, their interactions done with another language so we can handle a variety of other languages as the situations arise. So the goal is to have a diverse workforce, including, as I said, people who speak languages other than English. Uh, particularly, we're looking for people who could be empathetic and caring while still being able to work quickly and maintain high quality standards. Um, I think that that's a really important aspect to remember is that people who are in this situation are often um, distressed, may have other stressors going on in their lives as well. And so understanding their needs and being able to support them in this time, provide information and make sure they have the resources they need is really a critical aspect of the contact tracers work. Um, contact tracers need to have a good comfort level with technology because we are using um, a system which we believe will be easy to use, but does require some proficiency uh, with some basic computer uh, technology. Um, this is an opportunity for people to work from home uh, and there will be set work shifts scheduled for one or two weeks in advance. Um, so uh, successful candidates will also need a quiet place to work to protect the confidentiality of the data and the people that they are working with um, and to ensure that they have a place that they can work generally without interruption. Um, we are, as I said at the beginning, we are well on target to have all this hiring done and training completed, contract, uh, contact tracers ready to go before the system launches at the end of the month, and we are looking forward to getting started and helping you reopen the economy in an effective way. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for your commitment to helping us uh, achieve success. So now we'll hear more about what is happening on the ground here in Delaware. For that, we'll turn to Evie morales yoke a licensed practical nurse at our own Division of Public Health. Thank you for joining us, and we look forward to hearing your comments about what you're seeing. Oh, thank you, Dr. Walker. So yes, uh, this week, actually yesterday, we started with the um, uh, tracing, uh, or um, this uh, tracing uh, will help us identify uh, people who have been exposed 
exposed uh, to COVID-19 and also uh, to find potential new cases uh, and hopefully stop or slow, uh, or slow down the spread of the uh, disease. Um, our contact uh, tracing team will make uh, calls to those who, have, who were identified as contact by confirmed uh, COVID-19 cases and then we will monitor them over a period of uh, 14 days and to determine who becomes sick or, and hopefully who doesn't uh, become sick during the uh, period. And uh, in addition, <laughs> a staff like me uh, will be wearing a uh, Delaware Division of Public Health will uh, come to your house if we are unable to locate you by phone. Uh, we might, um, we will be wearing a mask. We might be wearing a uh, face shield and uh, we are gonna be identifying ourselves uh, as who we are uh, when we come out uh, to your uh, home. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. So Walker. Thank you, Ms. Gracias. So thank you for all that you're doing in your service for the people of Delaware. We have lots of questions, so we'll get started and try to get through all of them. Um, first, for Tolbert, you faced significant barriers doing contact tracing in Liberia. What lessons did you learn and what lessons could you share for us here in Delaware? Thank you, Secretary. The, the lessons that we, we learned is that uh, getting the, the contacts can be difficult, especially when stigma is associated with the disease. For Liberia, the, there was a lot of stigma associated with the disease because of the, the high case fatality rate of the disease, meaning the, the number of people that contracted the disease that would die at that time before the outbreak was declared over was about 50% case fatality rate, which was very, very high and a lot of people were getting sick and so the stigma was associated with the disease and people were afraid they were they were hiding themselves when they got affected they were affect other people so the reproductive numbers of the disease has increased from we were expecting between less than one percent to less than two percent but sometimes with 2.5 percent reproductive number is the number of if someone is confirmed from a disease, the number of people that they will, they will infect, that's the two or three persons in uh, Ebola, that was increasing and they spreading the disease. So we had to do enough risk communication about the disease and community engagement. That is critical. In COVID-19, though the case fatality rate is not hard, but yet there are people who are in their homes who are confirmed and not reporting the cases. So my my experience and my advice public health advice would be enough awareness in the communities with people cell phones uh, television a lot of americans watch television the, the radio station and the mode of communication that is applicable in delaware whether people listen to radio whether it's by television whether it's by television art whether it's by text messaging on your phones or calling at their homes the luxury and technology that is here in the United States, we don't have that kind of luxury. So we're treating uh, shoe leather epidemiologists to go from house to house, home to home, village to village, sometimes walking hours. Here, you can reach to a home by an alley, you can call a phone, you can, you, you know the address, you know the zip codes and all of that. So it should be easier here. So contact tracing can be done effectively. That's my experience. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for that. And your encouragement is greatly appreciated. Uh, for Evie, could you tell us a little bit more about what information a field contact tracer may ask for? So um, when we uh, either um, call you, uh, we will first I, um, provide uh, you with our name and the reason of the call, and we will uh, verify your name and birth date. Um, we will not ask for any other personal uh, information. Uh, we will uh, explain to you the reason of the call. Uh, we will provide you with information as far as uh, isolation, self-quarantine. Uh, we will also uh, provide you with uh, resources if needed. Uh, for example, uh, food assistance, uh, 
And if you need a thermometer, we will provide you with a uh, thermometer and hand sanitizers and things like that. Thank you so much. Uh, for David, what will the state do with their information? What will NRC do with the information? Um, NORC will do nothing with uh, people's information. The, um, we are solely acting as the, uh, as the interface with, the, with many of the residents that we contact by phone. The data are all kept on uh, state servers and in state databases, and our staff have no access except to the particular records that they're working with at any time. Um, as well, uh, we train our staff in confidentiality and protecting uh, people's privacy and uh, rights in their data. And so um, we will neither have access to it, use it for other things, uh, and treat it with the utmost respect. Thank you. And, you know, I think from the state's perspective, it's also important for me to share that information collected is protected by HIPAA and state privacy laws. Our vendors have signed agreements that they will comply with these privacy laws, and their employees will be trained on how to maintain confidentiality. So your information will be safeguarded as required by state and federal privacy laws, and we will not share it with anyone uh, in, in order to keep you, your privacy information safe, your health information safe. Um, it is important I, uh, for this to be successful, for us to be able to have open communication, so we don't want you to be worried if someone does reach out to you. For uh, Tolbert, a related question, for successful contact tracing, how long should Delaware think about keeping this information collected during contact tracing about, you know, who may have been exposed and risk factors? Dr. Walker, um, um, great question. Thank you very, very much. And your previous speaker said it very well, confidentiality, privacy, uh, keeping people information and respect for autonomy is very, very much critical in, in public health. And I am encouraging our people to give their information. The information should be safeguarded, should be very much safeguarded by the state health department is, is, is critical. That information is, can be used for public health purposes. And the reason is you want to stop the outbreak and to stop the outbreak is to know where the disease is. Confirming the cases, knowing the laboratory results, gave you who the person who was confirmed have come in contact with. That information should be kept and secure for public health purposes. It depends mm -hmm. on what the state regulation it is, is and how to use it. We still keep some of the data in Liberia in our database and in West Africa that dealt with Ebola in the Ministry of Health and Public Health Department. Those are significant information could be used for research in the future for knowing people who came in contact with the disease. For us, some of that information was used to do something we call CMET testing for research. What we did was people who came in contact with Ebola could still have Ebola in their cement. So we look at some of the data to control Ebola for public health reasons and we use those data for public health research and other that we do with people's consent. It does not violate their rights. So it depends on the public health department on how you want to utilize the data, but confidentiality is critical. Thank you so much. Um, someone asked a similar question about whether the contact tracers may talk to their primary care physician or give information to their doctor if the doctor calls. Um, I just want to, again, reassure everyone that contact tracers will not reach out to your primary care physician um, if you are diagnosed with COVID-19, it is possible if the, if the physician orders the test that they may have access to those results, just like they would any other test results. Uh, but it is critically important to know that public health will continue to work with primary care providers and other healthcare providers to make sure Delawareans are receiving the most uh, up-to-date guidance. So just wanted to uh, emphasize that. Uh, the next question is for Edie. As a bilingual contact tracer and case investigator, are there particular barriers you must overcome with people who do speak Spanish as their primary language? 
I actually do not see it, uh, a barrier. I think that people feel more comfortable talking to someone in their own uh, language. So I do not see this as a uh, barrier there. Um, Thank you so much, Edie. Um, so I'll go to David next. Could you explain a bit more about um, the role of the community health worker in contact tracing and whether they will um, tell who may have exposed the individual uh, in the course of communicating with that individual? Um, right. So uh, for uh, contact tracers, whether they are uh, working by phone or in the field, as with many of the community health workers might, um, they will uh, they will not know the name of the person who provided the information about the contact. So there's there is a uh, barrier so that they cannot inadvertently share the name of the person who provided the information about that exposure. Um, in the calling situation. We have people working different shifts so that there is no way that they can accidentally take the information that they may have received from someone who is positive and share that with someone who um, is contacted uh, about their exposure. Those are done by two different people on any, on any given day. Um, in terms of the community health workers role in general, they will have two roles that are critically important. Um, the DHSS, um, has planned that most of the of the contact tracing can occur by telephone uh, because the penetration of uh, cell phones and landlines is so prominent throughout the state. However, there are a lot of people who will either not have good working numbers, don't have access to telephones, or are otherwise unreachable by phone. And the field uh, case investigators will be critical in working within their communities to identify people who cannot be contacted or uh, reached otherwise and to uh, to find out so that they will be identifying those people, finding their contacts and making sure that those people get notified uh, appropriately. They will also uh, be working in communities where they are known and trusted sources. So if people had been hesitant to share their information, they will have people working with them who uh, hopefully will be people that they know and trust as well. Thank you, David. Albert, I wonder if you could add on to that uh, explanation a bit and just talk about the importance of having those relationships in the community and destigmatizing uh, the contact tracing so that we can be successful in addressing this uh, disease spread. Thank you. I think uh, community trust is very, very crucial and essential. Community engagement is important. Everyone with a disease lives within the community and have a family. Community is made of family. Community is made of cohesiveness. And so having community engagement, having community trust and believe in the community people. And this is why some of the contact tracers, even if you're recruiting people within their own community, it works very well. People that understand the same language, that share the same tradition in the community, that know each other. Communion community is very, very much important in, in contact tracing. One of the things that when you were asking about what the information for contact tracing is used for, or for confirmed cases and knowing that and keeping it as a database in a health management information system, is that you hear a lot about antibiotic testing. You hear a lot about serial prevalence, serial prevalence of the disease. There are people at times who want to know who are susceptible to the disease or who have antibiotics to the disease. Some of the contact tracing information to you can be used for doing something like that with antibiotic testing or doing serial prevalence. So you combine that can help contact tracing can help to know your population. Again, people respect, concerned, working with them is very critical. Community engagement, very important, Secretary. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, Katie, I, I may have to tag on to this question with you, but um, someone asked what happens if they're a single parent and they get COVID-19 and they've had worries about what will happen to their children or their families if 
uh, they are exposed and test positive. Have you had any conversations like that yet? So um, they should not be uh, scared of uh, someone taking their child away because they have been uh, tested positive for COVID. Uh, we actually encourage, you know, uh, the families to stay together and of course, you know, uh, maintaining um, good, uh, safe practice, hand washing, keeping your distance. Um, the, the risk of exposure is there, but um, if you take the precaution um, necessary, it's, it, I can say I can say examples uh, that we have known people in the community that both parents have been sick with the virus and the kids had not uh, contracted the uh, virus. So, um, but it's always good to have a plan if you become very ill that you cannot take care of uh, your child. Always uh, have a plan. But there, uh, my understanding is that there. There will be uh, child care provided if uh, necessary, and that's the last resources, but your children will not to be taken away. Thank you. One of the other uh, questions that's come in is that one of the biggest worries that they have is about the stigma of losing their job or losing a paycheck uh, because of quarantine or isolation. And the state is certainly addressing those issues. Um, one of the questions is what is the state doing and can we help um, individuals quarantine and isolate safely? So uh, we are working very hard to make sure that people have what they need in order to uh, quarantine or isolate safely, safely. In some situations that means helping secure a, a hotel to stay or make sure that food is delivered, um, delivering prescriptions that are necessary. Uh, and working with the employer or other social supports and unemployment that may be in place. And I think this is a very important role that the state and uh, we are working very hard to make sure we're using resources to avoid the spread of disease and get people the resources they need. But it certainly is one that if you have questions about, please do call Delaware 211. Uh, you can reach us there and we will connect you to the necessary resources. But connected to that is a question um, and maybe for Edie again around overcoming the fear that immigrants may have around someone who's coming to their door or making phone calls. Um, and I know I've received questions about this. Are we going to share information? We are not sharing information, but also about additional resources that you've been able to connect uh, with that may be um, you know, particular for the immigrant community. So, um one of the main things is that we need to identify ourselves uh, why uh, we're there, who are we, and uh, we, uh, are, we need to make people understand that we are there to uh, protect uh, them and the uh, community. And like everyone has shared that everything is confidential, that we will not share your information with uh, anyone. Thank you so much. So for our last question, I'll ask this of everyone, and it may be a similar or slightly a different answer, but in your eyes, what does successful contact tracing look like? And I'll start with Holbert. Successful contact tracing, thank you. Successful contact tracing is finding 100% of the people coming into contact with a COVID-19 patient. That person must be traced because as long as there is a sick person with a disease in our community that we don't know about, that person can share the disease with another person. Then the outbreak goes on and on. That's a successful contact case. Granularly, find the cases, trace their contact, put them into isolation. Once there are no new contacts, the outbreak is over. Thank you. David, would you like to go next? Well, ultimately, success is not having to do contact tracing anymore. <laughs> uh, and uh, in, the, in the short term, what it means is having an efficient and effective process for reaching people in as timely a way as possible, because time is everything in the infectivity, in the in, in infectious period. 
And the quicker we can get to people and have enough resources to get there, ensuring that they answer the phone and feel confident and trusting of the people that they're talking to, um, that I think is, is going to be successful. So the, um, the, the more people who believe in the process are willing to answer the phone, who are willing to comply with the request made of them to, to protect themselves and their families and their communities, uh, those are the things that will, I think, indicate success for us all. Thank you. And Edie, it's not an easy question to answer at last mm -hmm. on, the, on the roster, but would you share your views of what success looks like from your perspective and work at DPH? I think that the only way that we can uh, be successful is that uh, we all work together. We all work together, uh, like, you know, we're all in the same boat, just different uh, parts. But if we all come together, we will build one and be successful. Thank you so much. And I, I completely agree. I think in order to be successful, we all have to take care of one another in our communities, take care of our neighbors, make sure that we're getting information out that's helpful and trusted. I'd like to thank our guests for joining me today on this uh, call, on this webinar. Thank you to our ASL interpreter for keeping up with us, particularly with me. Sorry, I'm talking fast again. Um, remember, if you do have symptoms of COVID-19, call your doctor about a referral for testing. If you don't have a doctor, you can call Delaware 211. And if you need assistance with social services, food, housing, transportation, unemployment, getting items delivered to your home, again, you can call Delaware 211. For the latest updates on COVID-19 in Delaware, go to de.gov slash coronavirus for updated information on testing, resources, and more information around where to go if you have questions. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you to my guests again. Thank you. Thank Secretary. you.